Hello. Hello! We are now recording. Welcome, welcome, everyone. I am everyone. so glad I didn't wear my green mustache today, because <laughs> boy, would I have felt silly. I love the suggestion of putting pink highlights in, though. Oh, yeah. I think I think that's good. Yeah. yeah. No, we know where I figured that out. <laughs> and are those horns or two party hats? Oh, I think they're horns. Yeah. Yeah, I would make them horns. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Uh, that... <laughs> Super good. Okay, just some extra people coming in. Um, yep. Yes. Hey, there we go. Sure. Super. I'll double up on that. I'll, I'll learn this thing next week. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah. It's all good. There we go. I think we're ready. Are you ready? Because That's today good, is, yeah, Nolan, dude, thank you. Ecology Day. <laughs> Wonderful. That's awesome. Yeah, it is Ecology Day. Um, so, um, Monday's class was the last of the evolution unit, and now we're moving into ecology and always though, remembering that we're bringing it with, with us, right? We're not abandoning evolution because everything only makes sense in biology in the context of evolution. Who said that? Dobzhansky. There you go. Good. Okay. Um, so, uh, delightful. No, wait. What? It was you. It was me. I, I just said it, yeah. but I was I mean, quoting it. Was it. <laughs> okay. Um, really good. So today is kind of like content light, kind of thinking light. Um, no. It is. No. They to- they've got a topic test coming up on Friday. Do not forget. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, good. Okay. Shall we? Shall we screenshot this and um, move on? Did anyone get the Wordle? Did anybody get the Wordle? What is the Wordle? Where is the Wordle? It's online. It's in the chat. It's in the chat. Oh, the Wordle is in the chat. If you would like to do the Wordle. Okay. I kind of have a problem with spoilers of Wordles, but anyway. What's the spoiler? I asked if everybody got it. Oh. You're not asking what it is. No. Oh, okay. Good. Okay. Sorry. There's no spoiler. Let us um, clear all of this. Oh, well done. Somebody got it? Hey, hey, Berku. Last recording's audio was really low. Okay. We can double check all of that. Audio for, for two speakers, like two people who are speaking, is often um, challenging. So thank that, you for the feedback. That's why you see, whenever in movies, two people never talk at the same time. <laughs> it's impossible. I don't know how they do it. Okay, so ho- thank you for the feedback. Yes, that's good. that's great. And there's some jiggery pokery that we can do afterwards. Yeah, um, exactly. If we know that. Thank you. Okay, uh, people still coming in? Come on in, folks. I'm kind of like reluctant to get started until everyone's here because it shouldn't start until everyone's here. Okay. But not everybody's. But here. not everybody's. But they are coming. Because they have Look, a topic test. They have a topic test, right? Okay. And they might be shoveling snow. <laughs> that's where I was. Yeah. If you can see the sheen on my head. I was out shoveling snow. It's heavy. And? Well, so for most of the people in my life, today is Tina Four Day. Um, (laughs) Ask about that later. But for much of the world, it is uh, Marmot Marmots. It is Groundhog Day, which is, of course, a day to celebrate Bill Murray more than anything. (laughs) And, oh my goodness, these last two years, if if ever there was a movie that, uh, that we were living in, what? Okay, so you're right, I, and I was I didn't want to interrupt you. Sorry, but I have another thing about Groundhog Day. It's very important. Okay, <laughs> tell us. If you like Groundhog Day, beg, borrow, or steal a Prime account and watch yeah. Palm Springs Palm with Jake Springs. Peralta. <laughs> well, and and the mother, the the actor that plays Jake Peralta, and it's very funny. And the mother that was met. Yes, it's good. Palm Springs is like the 2.0 Groundhog Day version. Yeah, the right? dancing scene. When she <laughs> <laughs> okay, no, no spoilers. Okay. Oh my um, God. So, um, uh, Smith, how do you feel when you see this film? You want to make me cry. Yeah. I want to cry. I feel very sad. Why? I, it makes me very happy and very sad at the same time. This is uh, ecology. This is this is the edge of the cloud forest where I work and where my heart sits, but my body doesn't right now. <laughs> no, and because of the pandemic, it's been a long time, right? It's been a long time. Yeah. I remember the last time you were there. It was two years ago, almost exactly. I was there yeah. just before 
when I came back through the airport, there was a "Have you been to Wuhan, China?" line. Right. But that was it. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Okay. Um, yeah. So we are moving on to ecology. Oh yes, and... Jake Peralta's friends call him Andy Sandberg when he's not <laughs> when he's not on the job. <laughs> That's his, funny. His mom. <laughs> I'm going to name you Jake Peralta. (laughs) Okay. Okay. Um, Wonderful. So uh, we're going to transition into ecology. um, And so let's just kind of take a moment to kind of recenter ourselves. um, Or maybe if you weren't at the beginning with us at the beginning of the course, this will be a new slide for you. Um, But just kind of like remind ourselves where we are, where we're moving. We're moving into topic two of biology. Um, in this sort of massive attempt to like integrate all of the biologies or some of the biologies um, uh, all into one course so that we can talk about how they're connected. So clearly in ecology we talk about giant taxa taking over the earth. Yes, (laughs) we talk about monster animals. Will someone not speak of the giant snail (laughs) making its way across Asia? (laughs) Yeah. Um, so, so what we're going to do is we're going to, um, this course really does provide us with an opportunity to talk about how they're connected. And so that's really what we want to emphasize, um, as we move from topic to topic to kind of get you to bring evolution with you. Um, and hopefully in the next few minutes, we'll help you kind of like formalize what that connection, um, actually is, or to like verbalize what that connection is. So, biodiversity, evolution, and ecology. True. This, this is a boring slide. We should take this out. No, it's great. Okay. It recenters us. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so we want to know, though, what um, what words, what ideas, what definitions come to mind My to you in your My words. What do we mean by biodiversity? Um, and so we've got a mentee for you uh, that you can share on if you can't access the mentee or you don't want to access the mentee um, and you want to just put your definition here on the slide. Use the text tool. Um, it's a lot less frustrating. Um, and, uh, and you oh, can... Oh, use the mentee. It'll um, be more fun. Yeah. <laughs> you can share your ideas. I must know more about the giant world-eating snail. Yeah. Well. Well. I, for one, will not be second-guessing our giant world-eating snail overlords. (laughs) So mum's the word. I think it was this, though, wasn't it? I don't know. Super. (laughs) Cheetos. There's a tiger. Yeah. This is great. Good. Excellent. Okay. 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 This is great. Thank you. Like over 200 of you have already participated on the mentee. Um, so let's kind of go through a little bit. We've got a few contributions here on the slide. Fantastic. And there we go. So what is biodiversity or what do we mean by biodiversity? So all sorts of like single words. There's uh, some more specific species in a geographic area, uh, balance, worms, pretty much everything's a worm, so you're not wrong. Oh, you're, not wrong. <laughs> you're not wrong. Um, world ending snails, yes. Um, different communities and species interacting with each other in an environment or habitat. Uh, the overall diversity of species in an area, variety of species, difference, difference uniqueness, yes. There was one somewhere somebody said Cheetos. I would love, <laughs> I would love a rationale for that because I think it'll make me laugh. Tigers. Uh, Among Us, yes, favorite game. We will be playing that very soon mm-hmm. in my lab group. Uh, very. Is it your issue. favorite game? It, I, it, it might be really? like my favorite like computer. What's the one with the, that we uh, shocked people? 
when we played it with our students. The cards. What cards? The cards against humanity. Oh yeah, that's that a good really game fun. too. <laughs> okay. Um uh how all forms of life work together, amount of different species, variety okay, yes. So all of these um certainly, certainly, certainly uh speak to biology, speak to some aspect of biodiversity. Um it uh it's all great. So I think like generally we're appreciating that there's like a lot of different types of life and um, the term biodiversity kind of talks about that, right? Is that okay? Is that like a good way of summarizing it? Yep. Are we and good there? you're going to get to some of the math of it as well as some of the yeah. je ne sais quoi. The je ne sais quoi, including this. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so it's really important, um, and we've said this, you know, multiple times about the, the importance of precision in language when we're communicating science or when we're communicating, I mean, just generally when we're communicating. Um, but, um, but specifically in biology, it, it's always really necessary to, um, to uh, qualify what it is that we're talking about because there are concepts or ideas that can change depending upon the scale, right? And we've talked already a little bit about biological levels of organization and scale and the idea of diversity or variation or difference kind of is different at each of these levels, right? So we've talked about genetic variation, right? Which would be a form of genetic diversity, right? But when we talk about variation at a larger scale, we use the word diversity. Um, but there are all sorts of ways of expressing the idea of variation uh, at these different levels. Um, and so the word biodiversity uh, has been used at different levels. For me, it's only one level, but I think for you, it's quite it's quite different, right? It's This is one of the quas of the je ne sais quoi, yeah. but I sais quoi. This is, uh, to me, one of the reasons biodiversity is exciting and that I like that we have a course where we talk about it at different scales, physiological, ecological, and evolutionary is that it itself scales to me, that I can study biodiversity with a DNA sequencer, with a microscope, with a satellite or satellite imagery. Yeah. Um, and those are different uh, slices, different tranches of the diversity of life. And before we, I wanted to get going, that the, the two people who are responsible for the contraction biodiversity or the elongated a form biological diversity, uh, both died in the past year. Uh, Tom Lovejoy and Ted Wilson. That's right. Um, okay, so many ways of studying or quantifying or describing biodiversity, yep. Yep. but I think what we need to do is come up with a common definition, a common understanding of what we mean by biodiversity. And I think probably, Yeah. do I read your, hold on, I do read your I your biosmosis. What is I think it? You're thinking about species. I think we're thinking about species. So that's a great place to start because yeah. it kind of sits in the middle. And if there is an elementary unit for biology, I will fight anyone and say that is the elementary unit for biodiversity. This is our mole and our meter. Yeah. Now, one of the cool things about species is that uh, we know <laughs> we know nothing. We are John Snow. We don't know about species. Um, this is not like a Dothraki. Yeah. Uh, it is known. No, it is not known. But okay. The definition of biodiversity, to be super clear, as clear as we can be, <laughs> the definition of biodiversity for the purposes of this course, but also most commonly in biology, is at the species level. So number of species within a habitat or within the context that you're describing, you can talk about biodiversity in terms of number of different species. So anchor yourself there, and then as you get familiar with that, realize that if if you've got that anchor, we could talk about genes, or we could talk about higher taxa yeah. or habitats, but number of species in a place. And we're yes. Now, the number of species in a place is important. Yes. Because, because sometimes it's high and sometimes it's low and sometimes it changes. It's like uh, skipping high, low, medium, low, <laughs> down, Okay. Okay, Grandpa. <laughs> okay. Um, so this there we is, go. yeah. <laughs> so the number of species in a place, the number of species, you've taken a course called bio biodiversity of whatever this class is called. And so maybe your family or friends will ask you, well, what's so how many species are there? And then the answer is it is not known. 
We do not know. The answer of how many species are named, we know. It's like just under 2 million names. And this is kind of the torture of life. It's a square torture, so I guess it's a casserole. Um, but it's a, this is, most species that are named are insects. Some species that are named are plants and flowering plants. The number of tree species, for example, just changed. The estimate just went up this last weekend by several thousand. But it's not a huge number. The number of insects is huge. Look at us in terms of the number of vertebrates. Like, nothing, not much. Other animals, that's also invertebrates. That's very disrespectful. And uh, crustaceans, spiders, and their kin. Now, this sits in the context of there may be if there are two million named things, say we'll round up, we'll be enthusiastic. There may be 10 million species that we share the planet with to name. That to me, that's as someone who studies this, that's an extreme underestimate. That's like the lower confidence interval. There's probably closer to 100 million. So 250 years after Linnaeus, 150 years after Darwin, we have done perhaps 2% of the naming work. That shouldn't be, dis oh, it's not discouraging. I find it exciting because these are the players in the play and we need to know uh who's saying bubble bubble toil and trouble and who's just the little red like ensign going down to the planet to get killed in star trek we need to know the actors in the drama so that we can give them credit yep cool and so it's kind of all connected then right if we're talking about species in terms of biodiversity and what a species is we're talking about you know how that happens through speciation events right and the, the 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 context in which it happens or the environment is ecology so so evolution is not just happening and then it gets pushed into the environment evolution is happening in the context not only of the, the physical environment but also the biological environment or the interactions uh, among species, right? Species can evolve together. If you think about um, uh, fish hosts and glochidia, or you think about you know all sorts of other types of relationships, this is the ecology. So what happens within that context or within the sink in this particular diagram is really important, it matters. Um, it's what selects with natural selection, right? Natural selection, sort of ecological selection, right? These are the things that are um, determining what is fit and what is not is the context. So, so these things are intimately connected um, in a way that we have always had difficulty dissociating into these discrete courses, right? Um, so that's kind of one of the reasons why we have this like three topic course is because of that intimate connection. There's some questions in the chat about numbers. Uh, I wonder if you can name a species if you discover it. And mm -hmm. in fact, you can. Um, yeah. And in fact, that naming job is a really important one. And we've, in my lab group, we've been part of naming just under 1,100 species of insects in northwestern Costa Rica in the past seven years. Yeah. What are your favorite names? That we named about 20 different flies and wasps after grade five school children in Guanacaste province in Costa Rica because they wrote an essay or drew a picture about the importance of wild nature and what it meant to them. Cool. And that, that's that, very cool. That makes this blubberer tear up. I love it. <laughs> Yay. <Yeah. laughs> cool. Um, and David Bowie has a spider, and it's awesome. Beyonce, uh, Beyonce <laughs> has a fly. If you've seen the crazy movie Arachnophobia with yeah. um, Jeff Daniels, Jeff Daniels has a spider species named after him oh, now nice. because of that movie. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay, so again, intimate connection, right? Um, we have these phylogenies from the evolution unit. Uh, we recognize that at each of these nodes, it, it's represented um, a speciation event, right? The evolution of a new species. Um, and... We've also suggested in the evolution um, topic that speciation events happen when there is a barrier to gene flow, right? Where immigration and emigration across populations or among populations cannot happen. You need to have this like isolation, genetic isolation. And the way in which genetic isolation happens is quite frequently ecology. Like it, it, it taps into sort of those stories or that domain. Right, so that's how we get this connection between um, ecology and evolution. Ecology is the context for evolution. 
And here are two kind of examples of how barriers to gene flow can happen, okay? One is called allopatric speciation, and the other is called sympatric speciation. Which one's your favorite? Um, I like both of them. I love allopatric. Or I love allopatric because I like thinking about mountains and rivers and divisions, like the interaction with the environment, the actual environment laying down laws that it's like, you can't, you shall, you shall like not Gandalf, pass. You shall not pass. <laughs> Um, but yeah. then sympatric speciation, I probably love more intensely because it really makes us so. So we see those allopatric; those in those are intuitive to us because they operate at the scale that we do. So we see the barrier. Yeah. Sympatric speciation requires empathy on our part to listen to the species in question and go, "You see something different. Yeah. We see you at the same place, but you do not see each other at the same place." And and that's. That's that's empathetic biology. That's listening to the species that we share the planet with, and that's, that's right. amazing. It's beautiful. So allopatric is where there is this sort of physical, this barrier, this I, you know, there's some kind of constraint that does not allow the two to intermix. With sympatric speciation, <clears throat> what we get is, you know, physically they are there, they are intermixing, but they are not inter breeding, right? Even though they are within the same habitat or the same place, there is some nuance there that is making it such that they do not interbreed. And that also is a barrier to gene flow. And sometimes that nuance after the fact for us can be like, oh, we should have seen that. Yeah. Like, they're in the same place. Yes, but one is active from May to June and the other is active from August to, sep to September. So they never see each other. Right. So it's from a physics, you're in some of you that survive physics or taking physics. So like from a physics perspective, it's like space and time. It, we should think of them as the same thing. Yeah, that's, right. that's right. And so think about it practically, right? You want to know what's in a habitat. So you set up a bunch of traps to catch things, right? And you set them up and you run them consistently for two weeks, right? You never let them go. And you end up with a whole bunch of things in your little trap, and you're like, okay, this is what's here, perfect, these are the same things, everything's fine. But the data would be different if, for example, if we're going to use Dr. Smith's um, example of, of activity at different times, what if you set up your traps and collected their contents every hour over those two weeks? you might see a very different story about the sort of temporal fluctuation of the presence and absence of the species over time. And so that's why this type of stuff really matters, right? Um, in order to kind of get a real deep dive, this non, well, we'll never have a non-human centric appreciation, but as we try to acknowledge that, you know, we create an incredible amount of bias in our sampling just by being human, there are better ways of going about appreciating the environment, spending more time in it, collecting data at different intervals, um, and sometimes not, like sometimes just backing off um, and watching things from a distance. Yeah, so the deep sea communities, we, we used to collect them with dredges that literally went Yeah. <laughs> so all the gelatinous things were like, I'm dead and I'm a schmear now. And so we had no idea which was which, who was whom, who was who. Yeah. And we had so, but now we have remotely operated vehicles with high um, quality video that streams and we can see them in place. And so these biases are critical to identify. But just like real life, the goal, we're, we're never, you can't ever remove bias. The best you can do is acknowledge it yeah. and try and work around it. And so that's important to do with your with your biodiversity science as well. It's, it's absolutely critical. And also what I mean by sometimes not is sometimes we as individuals are not the right people to be doing the studies. Mm. Um, so there are people out there who probably know a heck of a lot more. Um, and so tapping into some of that, you know, that hum existing human knowledge, the knowledge that has been around for a long time um, is is so important and way valuable. Um, and, and I think, I think that that's, that's really good. What that might look like now in a practical sense, um, one of the things that our department is doing, um, and I'm super excited about this, is exploring the opportunity for students to do graduate degrees research remotely so that they can stay in their communities and study with us, uh, you know, through Zoom chats and all of those things, um, so that the right people are in the right places to be doing the studies so that I don't have to fly to the Arctic anymore 
and you know if my students are always there. So sometimes it really is about who the scientist is um, and how they access the information. It's friggin' maple. Boy, it's old. <laughs> Has anybody, maybe people have seen this. We've had in class some students who know exactly this tree. Um, that because that was my house. That was my house. <laughs> yeah, because they live like right next door. Okay. So so ecology also speaks to the idea of, of figuring out why things are where they are, right? Why are the species here and also i think more fun why are they not why are their species not here <laughs> right so why why are they present or why are some species absent um and and that really can provide us with a lot of interesting information about uh, about biology about fundamental systems about the way that they work and about evolution right um, so take this tree for example um, it's huge it's very old um, and it is not within uh, a forest of other like trees, right? Well, it sure was when it grew. There we go. Sorry. Ah, Smith! <laughs> <laughs> you ruined the punchline. Dude, actu Captain Actually. <laughs> actually. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> you were that kid like that always had to have the right answer. Oh, oh! oh. oh. <laughs> Okay, so yeah, we can be curious about why this tree is in the middle of this farmer's field. Um, why is it 500 years old? Um, and uh, what is the age structure of the other trees in the area? What is the species composition of the other trees in the area? We can start to be curious and like investigate the story of this tree using ecological tools and ecological methods of inquiry, right? Okay. So how did it get here? That's kind of the question. And then, of course, we can ask, why are species not where they aren't? <laughs> um, yeah. So, so there are other questions about, you know, sort of these trends, these observations like this, which is called tree line, right? Uh, with elevation, as you move up an elevation, you start to notice these changes in the species that are there or the disappearance of species. Um, and sometimes, you know, the borders are quite prominent. This is a pretty hard border for ecology. For, certainly for terrestrial worlds. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and so it's a remarkable pattern. Uh, why are there no trees just here? Uh, and why are there trees down here? Right. So these are these are all types of ecological questions that we can work with. So why are species found where they are or not where they aren't? Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot to put in the wrong. I put in the wrong. I didn't change the code. So the code is exactly the same. Um, and what we want to ask you is what might some of the reasons be? So just work on. Oh, I've lost my mentee screen. Work on the answer to the question. What might be some of the reasons for a species being where they are or not where they aren't? And I'll refresh my mentee and give you the code in a second. If you're if you're still logged into the same mentee as before, it would be the same one, hopefully, unless the it changes. The code and the question are in the chat. Yeah, hold on one second. Oh, no, mentee just crashed on me. Okay. There's no I in mentee. <laughs> You mean there's no me in mentee? Oh, wait, there's both. There's both. Okay. Why? Oh. There's also Tim. It wants me to reset the results. Yeah. Okay, hold on one second. Sorry. So the code is the same. It's 14315923. And just need to reset the results. Menti, menti. Okay, so the question is, why are species found where they are and not where they aren't? And menti is uh, is struggling. Okay. Um, let's uh, have you put them in the chat if you want, and we can take a look at the chat. Sorry about that. Yeah, it's it's failing on us today. That's never happened, but. Um, is that maybe maybe oh now it's working good 
now it's working. So if you want to get back on Menti, if not, pop them in the chat, pop them on our screen. It doesn't matter. Um, super. Several of you have already contributed. That's great. Really good. Thank you. Um, okay. Wonderful. Good. That's great. Okay. Perfect. Let's take a look. Um, yeah, what's available for them to survive on may be different. Um, let's see. Oh, wait. All the way down at the bottom. Here we go. Different conditions, invasive, reproductive barriers, access to resources. Different environments favor every species in a different way. Very, very good. Yes. Physiological advantages. Exclusive clubs. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Humans. Thank you. Very good. Yes. Deforestation. Harsh conditions. Cheetos. <laughs> okay. Um, elevation. Human impact because the environment favors them and that place is where they can have their habitat. Yes, absolutely. Good. Soil, food availability, climate differences, resources. Good. Conditions. Uh, oh, where did that one go? It looked good. System boundaries and adaptability. Super good. Yeah. All of these things, right, are part of it. And, and really the, the sort of the art of ecology is to design ways of investigating such that you can then kind of hone in on what the answer in this situation might be, mm -hmm. right? Because there are multiple competing hypotheses until you can narrow it down. So here are some competing hypotheses, right, for why a tree might be where it is uh, or why it isn't where it is not, okay? The first one, it's kind of your favorite, right? I certainly love it. And working where I do and with what I do, it often is the explanation. It evolved there, and it is only found there. And so why is it there? Because it is nowhere else. That's right. Range expansion and range shift are different, okay? Um, and the way that we might go about um, setting up a a system to answer it may be different as well. So a range expansion simply means that their range of that species is increasing in surface area or in depth or whatever, you know, sort of axis of distribution that species is on. So the range is expanding. Uh, the amount of habitat that they're occupying is actually increasing, right? A range shift means that, yes, it's expanding in one direction, but it is collapsing in another direction, like behind it, right? I have like a very sort of terrestrial approach to the way that I'm describing this, but also think about it in terms of a three-dimensional space, um, like uh, within an ocean system or a lake, right? So it can also go up and down, less so with terrestrial, but the idea is that somewhere it's collapsing, right? It's, it's, it's losing um, access to that habitat. So then there's movement and the idea that species, why can, how did it get there? Well, it could get there because as well, unless you're in the, in middle earth, trees generally don't get up and walk, but of <laughs> course they do move and they move by pollen, they move by seeds. And so, uh, proper long distance dispersal with wind, but also so that things can be moved, um, as burrs, as sitting on other species attached to the legs of ducks attached to the, all sorts of things. They can be introduced, uh, associated with other species by us. We're a great species mover. Um, seeds transported by migratory does introduced by humans. But then it can also happen with vicariant events or vicariant events where there's a splitting. So that kind of range that Dr. Jacobs was talking about, perhaps there was some tectonic event, some, um, massive belching of a pre, like the, Lake Agassiz, the, the great, great lake that used to sit in the middle of North America when the glaciers blew it out. It created a river that is just an absolutely unimaginable force that then would have split the shorelines 
in a way that for terrestrial organisms they could not have crossed. And so that was a vicariant event that said, okay, well now on either shore you're going to be breeding independently. Does that go on for long enough that then when you can see each other again, you're like, oh, I don't see you at all. Yeah. Vicarious for me is that the most difficult one to kind of wrap my head around. Um, and so what I what I usually think about it in order to like, you know, separate it from the others is that it isn't the species that is moving, but yeah. it's everything else yeah. <laughs> that is shifting or moving. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it's the if you're imagining like the old world with lots of. Um, uh, airports and you're in an airport and you're sitting on a on one of those moving sidewalks yeah and somebody's going and you're passing each other it's like that's a vicariant event you're <laughs> farther and farther apart yeah okay good okay so um for the pre-lecture readings and sort of the stuff all the stuff that's available on uh course link uh as a kind of case study or inquiry case to bring you through some of these things and see how they might be applied um, we are going to be focusing on forest biodiversity. Um, and um, here are a bunch of other terms that we want you to kind of um, think about a little bit. So using your stamps, and if you could try not to actually stamp directly in the middle of the image, maybe on the border or something like this, could you please share with us which one uh, or ones uh, here are not a forest? just from these images. Which ones are not a forest? Super. Wonderful. Super good. Okay. This is great, thank you. Um, because it is really important for us to acknowledge that again, just like species, and we're gonna we're gonna grapple with the definition of species like next class, I think. Um, but um, but just like species, just like ecosystem, just like biodiversity, just like a whole bunch of words, they have potentially different meanings to us, and so that's why we have to be precise in our language when we you know, generate hypotheses or when we, you know, test predictions and things like this, right? Um, or when we write questions for topic tests, right? We have to be very precise. Um, and so we can't really use the word forest unless we all come to a common understanding of what it is, because clearly we think that it's different things, right? Um, so let's take a look at some of these. So, so number three was by far the most popular for getting X'd on the definition of forest. And what I would share with you um, is that I have a student in my in my lab uh, who lives in this landscape, who is from this landscape, and he would definitely call this a forest because when you get down on your hands and knees, all of these, and you can see them turning red, right? It's fall, it's the fall season. Um, all of these are willow trees. And they're this high. And multiple species of willow. And they're beautiful. The flowers that come out on these willow trees in the spring are just gorgeous. And they are 60, 70, 80, 90 years old. So they've got really thick trunks and really close together tree rings because they are on the Arctic tundra. So for many, many people, this is forest. There is no other forest, right? Um, and it's got a canopy and it's got all of the complexity that, that forests have, but it's like this high. <laughs> and what I love most is sometimes when you see these like big glacial rocks that are dropped right behind it in like the, the wind protected side, the willows will be like three feet high. These are monsters on the Arctic tundra, right? Yeah. So, so, so that's the, like the cheapest place in the world to do canopy research. <laughs> you, just, you don't need safety equipment. No, you to just get, up, get on your elbows and be like, yeah. Wonderful. And and it, it's it's absolutely beautiful. But so, for many of us, that's not a forest, right? And then the second one was probably the bottom number five, yeah. which lots of you selected as not being a forest. Which So if we think about bias, the last one is maybe a latitudinal bias of, of experience. The second yep. one might be a terrestrial bias of it's easier for us to breathe yep. with these land plants. But that's a kelp forest. And, that's right. And marine biologists and lots of 
thousands of species that depend on living in that vertically stratified environment. Yep. Um, that that is a forest by many definitions of the term. That's right. Number seven is actually a garden, um, but again, it could be a forest depending upon our definitions, right? So this is a this is a sort of attempt at um, like mixed cultivar, mixed yeah. cultivation, um, sort of um, multi-tiered gardening system, right? Where you have maximum biodiversity within something that is human cultivated for you know the purposes of nutrition now one of the next ones that people selected was number eight i think number which eight. is a natural a choice because i think what you're seeing there if i can tell me in the chat if i'm misinterpreting you're clicking on that for those of you who selected eight often it's the idea that well that's clearly a plantation yeah that's a crop it's not a forest, it's a crop. It's a yeah. long yield, uh, long duration yield crop. I think I would exclude that from definition of forest. Would you? Well, well it, it would depend to me on what else was living there. Because in this kind, those, this is a coniferous plant, which mm. changes the understory, it changes the chemistry of the soil and what kind of microorganisms can live there. It becomes yep. much more fungal instead of bacterial. So it certainly changes. It has characteristics. But I would, no, I would say from a abiotic perspective, yep. this has changed the thermal environment of that space like a forest does. In that way, it's acting like a forest. It's cool. Oh, I would, I would have excluded it. Okay. What about number four? This kind of, this field on the edge of a forest. Well, so number four and number two for me are kind of similar in that they are forests in waiting, right? And so if we, if we define forest by the existence of a canopy of trees, mm -hmm. then number two and number four are not forests, but they are full of a seed history, seed bank ready to go, such that if we just waited like a few generations, they would Okay, I'm going to stir the pot then oh. and say some forests enjoy legal protection. Urban yeah. forests enjoy legal protection. Four and two, would would, not be by your definition, would not be protected yeah. and would therefore not ever get the chance to be the nascent thing that they <laughs> are. Okay, so, so forest and, and is a loaded term. And some of you term. in the chat are talking about the fact that, yeah, if, you, if you've been going ahead in this inquiry unit and you've been listening to some of the interviews and videos that we do in the dairy bush yeah. and the field, there's a nascent, there are like thousands of trees there. Yeah. All and actually, you're here at Guelph in a year, in a weird year, for many reasons. One of them that it do, we don't actually talk about explicitly in the inquiry case of the dairy bush is that that field hasn't been mowed for three years. So if you kind of go by the dairy bush, you will see more forest than most students do because it's been uninterruptedly growing for three years. That's right. Yeah, cool. So forest is a loaded term. And I, I hope, I think, I mean, the point of having this conversation um, is... Here's to, the right answer. Is, no, and, and, yeah, and it's so... It's context. It depends. It depends. And, and we can use sort of different variables or different sort of yeah. sources of information in order to be able to make those decisions about what it depends on, right? Yeah. And in some cases, it totally depends on the human history in that place. Uh, yeah, in most places on the planet. Yeah. Inescapably, it does. That's like, right. Very explicitly here, that forest wouldn't have been a square for a little while, for a long time. That's um, right. But one of the cool, so that we're looking at an aerial view at the Google Earth view of the dairy bush and the associated field and Brown's Woods just to right the, there. and then the arboretum's over here oh, sure. and the um, wild ravine yeah. is up there too. One of the cool things about the dairy bush, I just have to throw this out there, is that there are some trees in there that are older than Guelph. They're older than Guelph. They don't look like giant. Sorry, old did you say older than God? Gulp. <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> and probably her too. Um, but one of the things about this that that I this is a small woodlot, and there are trees there that that who germinated when this was not uh, a city. There were certainly first peoples here for sure, but the um, colonization by European settlers had not happened. Yeah. So, so it's right here in the, in the kind of the middle of Guelph and right next to, you know, a, an urban wasteland here of, of big box stores and parking lots. And then there's this little piece of heaven and we kind of escape to it every once in a while just to kind of breathe. Um, and if in a I moment, spend a lot of hours you there. do. And, yeah. and, you know, if you kind of put on noise canceling headphones, you can like cancel out the, the auditory traffic. Um, and it can, it can feel quite, quite peaceful yeah, yeah the traffic you hear in the winter when the leaves are gone but uh in the summer you'll hear just 
yeah. the sounds of the forest. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, Dr. Smith uh, spends lots of time um, sort of helping to document who's there and what they're doing. And share it. And to share it. So this is the virtual, this is where our virtual forest um, was created. Um, and uh, we're always trying to get sort of cooler digital tools to be able to make it even better. Um, Throw in the chat how old you were in August 2009, if you could do that. <laughs> that would be cool. Is that when you started? Yeah. Ah, good. Okay. Um, and oh, if you live on this uh, image here, put us a, put us a stamp and show us where you live. <laughs> oh, is that what's going on with <laughs> no, this? No, I don't know. Somebody's like, it's, yeah. Anyway. Um, five years old. Five years. 19, 6, 15, 7, 5, 6. Lots Wonderful. of 5, 6, 7s. Yeah. And then 14, 15. And 14, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We, uh, Strangely, I was three. <laughs> no. It's been a really rough couple of years. Way old. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, uh, Dr. Smith has been taking a weekly photo using Gigapan technology since then. Um, every week on Wednesdays. Now, because we teach on Wednesdays, it's on Tuesdays. Um, the data set is ruined. Yeah, no. <laughs> and then going and taking this Gigapan photo in exactly the same spot. Uh, every single week for a very long time. <laughs> um, yeah. and, and has, in the past five years, has added to that uh, trail cam videos at den sites of different uh, animals that live in and around the forest. That's right. So this is, you can see this tree is kind of our, our landmark, right? This is uh, the Gigapan image um, uh, in four different seasons. Um, the top one is yesterday. The top one is yesterday. Okay. Yay. That's what it looked like yesterday. Yeah, when you get the slides, you can click on these and they'll take you to the, oh, take you to the place. Yeah, and then you can zoom in and see. You can see there was some cutting going on here, right? Um, yeah, that, that was a feature of last January. Yeah, that then got, um, so this was, yeah, this was like the spring, right? And then this was uh, as the summer started to progress and you can see the deadfall getting kind of absorbed into the landscape and that's you're going to be able to watch that for years that's going to take multiple many months and years for that to happen that's now right. but it's also it's also part of a story that's been ongoing in 2009 all of the trunks that you see on the ground were standing almost all of those trunks two exceptions but almost all of those trunks are white ash that were growing and living um and died uh, because of emerald ash borer and the they're beside a path and so the university decided to take them down which is fine, uh, but they also decided to leave the trunks on the ground as habitat for other kinds of insect, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool. Okay. So, oh yeah, you can see like this tree here with the little <clears throat> bee. Yep. There we go. You're you're getting like almost exactly the same. Wonderful. It is. Yeah, it's really cool. Somebody um, asked about the tree that you called it the centering tree. That's a eastern white uh, pine that was actually planted by Zabbitz. Uh, if you're on campus of Zabbitz Hall, where the fine arts uh, faculty is now, mm -hmm. Zabbitz was the first forester of Ontario. And there are white pines with uh, in the top one. You can see the white pines with their crowns. Uh, he planted all of those. Uh, but there, on this part of the dairy bush, there are trees that have never been cut down. They're almost all sugar maple, um, and there's other maple. There's many, as you'll find out in the inquiry case, many, many species of tree in there. Yeah, good. So so this is a way of collecting a, an astounding amount of data, <laughs> right? Over time, these sort of, you know, as... It, it, it still has some kind of human bias, but but in many respects, because you're not going out and, and counting things and then transcribing them into a notebook, you're just taking the image. It does help to remove quite a bit of the of the bias associated with data collection. The problem is you get this like gigatons of data, right? That you then have to figure out how to analyze and work with. But it is an incredibly valuable data set. And because it's been going since 2009, we are realizing its value now, um, and and it's just it's just amazing the things Pe that we can do with it. People are listening in a way that they did not in yeah. 2009. <laughs> Long-term data sets are critical, especially for for doing sort of studies in evolution and ecology. So, yeah, just in the last few minutes, we, you've already been introduced to these places, right? But we wanted to, we're, we're not going to talk about them right now because you have them, but we wanted to show you that we've put them in the slides as well for your use, if you would like, if it's helpful. So here are the inquiry case woodlots, um, you know, with the, the difference of so the dairy bush, Browns Woods, North Campus Ravine, and the Arboretum. Um, 
and then there we go. Um, here is a kind of legend in order to help you because what we've done as we kind of learn how to use the, 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 the modeling and the formulas for describing biodiversity, um, we're going to do them on sort of stylized woodlots. So this is our dairy bush for the purposes of what we're going to do next time uh, and the time after. So we're going to sample it. We're going to sample it. It does not matter how many species you see here, as long as you decide on how many species you see here, and you can go through the formulas and the math. It, whether you get exactly the same answer as somebody else, that matters not a bit, but it's about the thinking and the deciding. And it is super difficult, and, and I think you've, some of you have experienced that um, doing some of the species identification uh, with, the, with the images that, that we've provided. Um, it's not always obvious because of that variation that exists within individuals right in a population and so it can be frustrating and and sort of being comfortable with that uncertainty is 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 exactly what we want you to do so is this the same species as this or is it different we want you to go through the process of deciding but ultimately what you decide doesn't matter it's why you decided it right so this is Brown's Woods, again, with some different species for you to grapple with some of the, the formulas that we're going to go through um, in the next couple of classes. Okay, And then this is North Campus Ravine. So all of that will be available to you when we post the, the lecture materials um, at the end of class. Um, just in the last minute, if you wouldn't mind, if you had no other information than what you've already had from the pre-lecture readings and you had to decide to build condos on one of these, basically to bulldoze, sell and bulldoze one of these, which one would you choose right now? Kyle's like, none. Good answer, Kyle. Good answer. <laughs> We have a few that are in Camp None. <laughs> None. But boats are spread out. Boats are spread out, That's right? Good. Okay, okay. Fair enough. North Campus Ravine's getting like a lot of hate, though. Um, and that's okay. Why? Why? Okay. So, as we go through this unit, we may ask you a couple more times based on different information that we'll share with you, and we'll kind of like weigh them and value them to see if we can come up with a decision about what, what to do with these. So with that, um, we will say, I think that's it. No homework, obviously, because you have a topic test coming up. Um, we will say goodbye, and we'll see you next time. Take care. Take care of yourself. Take care of someone else. <laughs>